Hello. In our last lecture, we looked at a catastrophe, the Rwandan genocide of 1994. We had to. There was no way to avoid it. It would be a disservice to do so in a course such as this one. I nonetheless attempted to end with some hope, even in that situation, by looking at the remarkable life and words of the Rwandan peace, uh, priest and journalist Andre Sibumana. Today, alas, we examine another catastrophe of an entirely different sort, but indeed with a much deeper and wider impact. And I refer, of course, to the plague represented by the spread of HIV AIDS in Africa. And after detailing its horrors, I will again attempt to end with a note of hope by looking at a couple of places, Senegal and Uganda, where HIV AIDS has been contained or indeed rolled back. Now, disease has been a major factor in human history, and we know a lot more about this than we used to. We've encountered it at several junctures already in this course. We looked at it as a partial explanation for why there was a turn toward labor from West Africa to serve in the plantations of the Americas. We looked at it as a further blow to the Khoisan peoples in the old Cape Colony, already reeling from Dutch pressure and then undergoing a smallpox epidemic in 1713. We know that the year-round warmth in tropical Africa has provided a hospitable clime for the microbes causing diseases for many, many, many thousands of years. The diseases common in Africa for a long time, like malaria, yellow fever, river blindness, the legendary African diseases, if you like, are factors which have quite plausibly contributed to Africa's relatively low population growth and lack of economic development. More recently discovered diseases like Ebola or Marburg fever are horrifying in their symptoms, but thus far have had little widespread impact. That is not true, not remotely true, unfortunately, for another relatively recent arrival, HIV AIDS. And by the way, HIV stands for Human Immunodeficiency Virus, and it is that virus which leads to AIDS, which is Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome. AIDS is a global phenomenon. It's a pandemic, not just an epidemic. And it has already had incomparably greater impact on Africa than anywhere else on the globe. So much so that even if today, if we could imagine that everything that could be done to counteract HIV AIDS in Africa were to be done, we would still be reeling from the effects for decades to come. Remarkably, by the way, this is the first epidemic of a totally new human disease uh, in the world uh, since the 1400s. The statistics, both in the world, but most especially in Africa, are staggering, but they bear review. In 2005, the world was approaching 30 million deaths from AIDS. It was uh, exceeding 40 million people worldwide who are positive with the HIV infection. Now let's try to put that into perspective. This means that something on the order of 3 million people are dying as we move into the late part of the first decade of the 21st century. 3 million people dying per year. That's an average of something like 8,200 persons per day. Uh, approximately three times as many as died, for instance, in the attack on the World Trade Center, September 11th, 2001. By 2010, the deaths from HIV AIDS will have surpassed the black deaths, so-called, of the 14th century, which began in Asia and, of course, swept through Europe, uh, leaving one quarter to one half of the population uh, dead. It will exceed, by 2010, the second greatest population catastrophe of all time after the bubonic plague or the Black Death, and that was the depopulation of the Americas uh, 
uh, in the aftermath of the Colombian and other voyages. And of course, that was part of the reason why I referred to the turn to West African labor uh, in, the, in the history of the Atlantic slave trade. It will approach, by 2010, the total death toll uh, will approach the total death tolls of World War I and World War II combined. Something on the order of three quarters, 75 to 80 percent of this entire burden of HIV positive infections, of deaths from AIDS, will fall on Africa. In every major sub-region of Africa, the percentage of adults who are HIV positive is at least 5 percent. That's compared with a U.S. rate of less than 1 percent. The lowest rates in Africa are in West and North Africa. They are higher in Central and East Africa. But the epicenter of the pandemic is Southern Africa, with the highest rates by far in the world. The landlocked country of Botswana's rate is over 30 percent. Zimbabwe is not far behind. And the country in the world with the largest absolute number of HIV-positive adults is the critical country of the Republic of South Africa. Now, AIDS was first identified in the United States in the early 1980s, usually said to be 1982, but almost certainly originated in Central Africa. Almost all authorities agree that HIV jumped, if you will, from simians, that is, from uh, monkeys, chimpanzees, etc., to humans. But exactly how this trans-species jump occurred is not completely clear. One quite realistic possibility, and indeed the prevailing theory for the origins of this trans-species jump, uh, is sometimes uh, caricatured as the, the so-called cut African or so-called bushmeat theory. And it suggests that there was a blood transfer from simians to humans in Central Africa, where indeed uh, these animals are sometimes uh, hunted and slaughtered for, for food. I should add that in many other parts of Africa, even next door in Zambia, uh, these are considered quite taboo, and people are quite shocked that in the Belgian Congo, for instance, the former Belgian Congo, that people would have uh, slaughtered chimpanzees or monkeys for, for food. In 1999, Edward Hooper published a massive book entitled The River, which suggested, though it did not prove, and nor did it, uh, Hooper claim that it proved, that HIV may have been introduced to, to humans in a, a very different, a radically different way. He theorized that this could have occurred when some one million people in the former Belgian Congo, now the Democratic Republic of the Congo, were given trial doses of oral polio vaccine in the late 1950s. The vaccine used in the trial, sponsored by Western scientists, was developed using chimpanzee tissue. Now, Hooper is not a, a crackpot. He's uh, a former UN official, a BBC, a former BBC reporter. His theory certainly remains uh, unproven, but continues to con uh, provoke controversy. At the very least, quite apart from AIDS, it does raise troubling questions about drug trials in African and other third world populations, about conducting trials of drugs in poor populations, often desperately poor populations, and populations desperate for medications of any kind, uh, in order to develop drug, uh, drugs which would eventually, of course, be marketed uh, for profit. If you would like to read a most engrossing uh, novelization of this subject, I would uh, suggest the noted espionage writer John Le Carre's book, The Constant Gardener, much of which takes place in Africa, uh, now made into a, a, a motion picture. Now, why has HIV AIDS spread so much faster in Africa? What are the manifestations, social, economic, even political, of its impact? First of all, AIDS was almost surely around in Africa well before it was even identified, before anyone had even heard of it in the early 1980s. 
It was growing and being spread before there were any tests to detect HIV. Indeed, before the link between HIV and AIDS was, was confirmed. Before academic tracking systems emerged. Before antiretroviral drugs, ARV drugs that I'll refer to later, uh, which treat the, the symptoms, were, were discovered. Thus, in Africa, there was very much of a, a sort of a rolling start for this entire epidemic making it that much more difficult to reverse. Again, the momentum that an epidemic develops uh, often plays itself out years after uh, the most energetic efforts to, to put it into uh, reverse. One reason for the delay in identifying AIDS, of course, is that it weakens the immune system, and that means in in, in turn, that it is secondary infection, like pneumonia, for instance, which actually sickens and finally kills uh, an AIDS victim. Uh, in addition, remember that the HIV virus can be inside the human body for seven to 10 years before there are any symptoms at all. So these factors can still lead today, can lead to people uh, avoiding the acceptance that HIV or AIDS was or is the key problem. Now, HIV AIDS is spread essentially five ways. Through heterosexual contact, through homosexual contact, through intravenous drug use, the, the so-called dirty needle uh, syndrome, through the distribution of tainted blood supplies. It was probably that which led to the death of the uh, a great American uh, tennis player, Arthur Ashe. And finally, uh, through the transmission of the virus from uh, a, a, an HIV positive mother uh, to, her, to her child. In the United States, AIDS was concentrated at first in the homosexual community and amongst intravenous drug users. In Africa, on the other hand, it has spread almost entirely through heterosexual activity, although the last uh, method I mentioned, the transmission from, from positive uh, mother to, to child, is gaining on that, although it's obviously a product of heterosexual activity. It has been predominantly heterosexual activity then, and almost by definition, this involves a far greater number of people. After all, this is part of the universality of, of human experience. So, some people quickly assume, therefore, that promiscuity, especially of African males, uh, is, the, is the problem. And indeed, the whole notion of AIDS being one more thing which afflicts Africa, and that it is this promiscuity, sexual promiscuity, which explains its prevalence there, really falls into a whole kind of Africa is lost, the sad realities of Africa kind of dismissal of the place which I brought up in my very first lecture in this, in this series. The notion would go something like this, as the South African Karen Yockelson has put it. The notion of seeing Africa as, quote, a sick and dying continent, harboring deadly disease and inhabited by an essentially promiscuous people who are part of a dangerous, wild, natural world and bound by primitive traditions and superstitions. Now, I personally have great doubt, great doubt, and I know of no reliable evidence that a tendency toward promiscuity is any more pronounced in Africa than, than elsewhere. And in fact, part of the stigma and stigmatization of HIV positive people, of people with AIDS, is one of the real problems in addressing uh, the identification and therefore the prevention of further spread. Part of the stigmatization is precisely because one will be suspected of promiscuity uh, if, if that is uh, the, the case. I might uh, just say a word about this, this stigma. In 1989, I was uh, working in Zambia, and I read the, the national newspaper there, a, a sort of, you know, feature column. There, there was a style column, if you like, written by a quite hip, university-educated young Zambian woman. And the message in her column was essentially this, that she had stopped jogging. And the reason she'd stopped jogging was because it had assisted her 
to lose weight, which was her original objective, made her slender. But remember that in many parts of Africa, the nickname for AIDS is in fact slims from the wasting away that people sometimes go through. She didn't want to raise the slightest possibility of that to uh, avoid that uh, conceivable stigmatization. Now, I mentioned that uh, I find it unconvincing a higher overall rate of any sort of promiscuity, although I think it is only fair to add that there are some very articulate African women, perhaps of the sort I just mentioned, who have had harsh words on this score for men. And I will return to gender uh, inequality uh, in a moment. I think better explanations have to do with labor migration and, and poverty. And we know that these have enormous histories and enormous realities in Africa's past and in its present. When one spouse, usually the male, goes away to work for a substantial time, it doesn't take notions of, quote, natural or cultural predispositions uh, toward promiscuity to posit that this creates an atmosphere which facilitates, which, uh, you know, almost invites the possibility, at least, of multiple sexual partners. Labor migration is a deeply ingrained pattern, as we have seen in this course, and above all in southern Africa, the epicenter of this uh, epidemic in Africa. The relationship between overall poverty and disease is, of course, uh, clear and, uh, and affects many other diseases beyond uh, HIV uh, and, and AIDS. Uh, uh, limited access to health care or to health education can result in higher rates of other sexually transmitted diseases, such as herpes, genital ulcers, and so forth. And these are shown to quite clearly increase the rate of transmission from an HIV person, a positive person, to a sexual partner. Poverty can also make condom use prohibitively uh, expensive. Uh, although, as we'll see, there's also evidence of cultural rev uh, resistance to this as well. Now, I mentioned gender inequality and inequality between men and women. It's a reality and not just in Africa, of, of course. Women are unlikely to have as much access to education or to resources. They are less likely to have the, the knowledge, the resources to either be independent or to negotiate safe sexual relationships with, with men. There is a cultural expectation, for instance, that wives are not to, to resist the sexual uh, advances from, from husbands. Young girls, in particular, find themselves in, in situations mired in poverty, tempted into sexual relationships from older men precisely because of that poverty. In Uganda, they say, in fact, sex is the poor girl's food. The AIDS pandemic can be deceptive. If you visit Southern Africa, you're not going to see writhing, hemorrhaging bodies on the sidewalk, on the streets. The sad truth is that people withdraw to back rooms. They withdraw to dark huts and waste away. The impact of their withdrawal, their eventual loss if they die, affects just about everything, almost every aspect you can think of in what makes a society go. It affects everybody. It has affected me personally, though obviously indirectly. I've mentioned my first love, Zambia, many times. It's a Southern African country, and one out of every six adults in Zambia is HIV positive. My long time, three decade long, best friend and research partner in Zambia has lost his second born son in 2003, his third born son in 2004. These were men that I knew well. They were men in their 30s. And that age is typical of those, for obvious reasons, of sexual activity, uh, uh, for those who contract HIV or suffer the ultimate consequences of AIDS. People in their most productive years, their 20s, their 30s, their 40s, not just for themselves, but of course for their entire societies. One report from Zambia, for instance, uh, notes that the AIDS epidemic severely damages every sect sector of Zambia's economy. In the first place, employers bear the direct costs of absenteeism, 
medical care, funerals, and extra recruitment. What is even more significant is that as AIDS kills people in the prime of life, the workforce is stripped of valuable skills and experience. The situation becomes yet worse as there are fewer people to teach the next generation. All of this means that production costs rise while at the same time consumer spending falls because people affected by AIDS have less money to spare. Zambia has been one of the world's poorest countries since the late 1970s and AIDS has made a bad situation even worse. That paragraph mentioned the impact uh, of teachers. Consider this, in the year 2002, Zambia lost 2,000 teachers to AIDS. Food security is a subject, obviously enough, not to be taken lightly in Africa. Sick people cannot work fields, and it is uh, certainly not at all a difficult link to make between the HIV AIDS epidemic and the food shortfalls that we've seen in a number of countries around the continent in the last decade. When adults in the age groups I have just mentioned die, they of course often lead children, leave children. AIDS orphans is a real, it's a huge, and it's a growing problem. Some say that we're approaching 15 million children orphaned uh, by AIDS across the continent now. Zambia's estimate is something like 650,000 uh, people. Uh, as one, again, Zambian expert said, in the days before the full impact of HIV and AIDS pandemic, treat, street children were a very rare sight in Zambian cities and towns. Now they are everywhere, sleeping under bridges, behind walls, and in shop corridors. These kids may be the AIDS victims that you will see if you visit Southern Africa. Sleeping in that street, in the park, leaping out to watch your car, when you park. You agree to pay them the small amount, both because you want your car intact when you come back, and out of simple compassion. You will see them. It doesn't take a stretch of the imagination to see that they could obviously be tempted into far less legitimate uh, kinds of undertakings. AIDS presents security and crime issues as well. So, what hope is there? Antiretroviral drugs, I mentioned this before, can radically improve and extend an AIDS uh, patient's life. Perhaps the most famous American to contract HIV might have been the basketball legend Magic Johnson. And the fact that he leads not just an active, even a vigorous life, uh, nearly 15 years after announcing that he was HIV positive, shows the effect that uh, antiretrovirals can, can have. The disease is no longer necessarily fatal at all. But the problem in Africa, of course, is cost. Recently, however, there have been breakthroughs here, uh, with drug companies agreeing to provide drugs at a greatly reduced um, um, price or permitting generic manufacturers. The companies, it has to be said, resisted that right through the late 90s and were uh, backed by the World Trade Organization and indeed by the American government. They brought lawsuits, for instance, in South Africa, a very famous lawsuit, uh, which sought to prevent South Africa uh, manufacturing its own generic versions of ARVs or purchasing them cheaper from places like India. Uh, the first defendant named in that lawsuit was uh, President Nelson Mandela. As you can imagine, this was a public relations disaster for the pharmaceutical companies. And indeed, uh, to their credit, they have withdrawn from that and, as I say, made the affordability of these drugs uh, much, much greater. But the key, obviously, at every stage is public education. It's popularizing the knowledge of the causes of HIV AIDS and how to prevent it. It's overcoming the stigma. Of, H of HIV AIDS, which still leads many people to avoid the subject. There is misinformation out there. People have told me that they believe that it's witchcraft and not the HIV virus. There is this need for well-informed people, including people who have the virus themselves and those who support them, to carry the message of how this thing can be reversed. The role of leadership, of public leadership, by those at the top seems to be critical. It is this that has made the statements and policies of South African president, the man who succeeded Mandela, uh, that is Thabo Mbeki, 
so troubling. Mbeki is a gifted and, and very intelligent man, but for a long period of time, and it is that time which uh, makes this so sad, he was openly skeptical that HIV causes AIDS. Although he never denied that link explicitly, he was connected with a small group of dissident scientists who have questioned that, despite the overwhelming evidence to the contrary. Though he's rather reluctantly changed course, precious time has been lost. Again, there's a way in which the momentum of this is, does not um, yield its deadly reward until years after the first steps are taken uh, to reverse it. His predecessor, of course, Mandela, although admittedly mostly after he left office, has increasingly used his retirement to tirelessly publicize AIDS awareness. You may have seen Mandela wearing a t-shirt in which, uh, on which it says HIV positive. He's not, but he's casting his lot with those who are in order to lend his enormous prestige toward the erasure of that stigma that we've talked about before. His old rival, Gachabutalezi, leader of the Zulu nationalist organization in Kata, announced that his son had died just as Mandela's son had died from this disease. The former president of Zambia, Kenneth Kaunda, has launched the Kenneth Kaunda Foundation precisely to address the problem of AIDS orphans in cities like Lusaka, uh, the capital. Probably the most successful cases of rolling back the pandemic have occurred in Senegal and Uganda, one in far West Africa, one in East Africa, and again through aggressive and clever public education utilizing music, drama, film, etc., to get the, the message out. And again, the personal role at the top has been critical, and I'll, I'll come back to that in the case of Uganda in a second. In Senegal, there's been a sort of liberal and conservative arm of this anti-AIDS attack, if you like. Senegal tolerates prostitution, for instance. Commercial sex industry is often an epicenter of these uh, uh, epidemics for understandable reasons. Tolerates prostitution, but insists that prostitutes commercial sex workers be registered, that they be given medical examinations, that they be supplied with condoms, uh, et cetera, et cetera. The conservative arm would come from a quite conservative Islamic clergy, which has spoken openly of the dangers from HIV AIDS from the Islamic equivalent of the pulpit. It's also an interesting uh, correlation between the very high levels of male circumcision in Islamic population uh, and this has been proven to be uh, a retarding factor in the spread of AIDS. In Uganda, when President Yoweri Museveni took power in 1986, one of the first things he did was to tour the country from east to west, top to bottom, talking about the danger of HIV AIDS. And again, putting this on the public agenda, this was uh, an enormous step and relatively early on. Uh, the, the message came to be in the education works in uh, 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 efforts in Uganda, the key phrase was zero grazing, which was a, a, a reference, of course, to the possibilities of more than one sex partner. They adopted the so-called ABCs of, of, uh, of, of education, A for abstinence, B being faithful to one partner, C condom use if you stray from the first two uh, prescriptions. prescriptions. In Uganda, from the early 90s to the early 2000s, the prevalence rate has fallen from some 14% to something on the order of 4 to 5%. This is a dramatic uh, instance of a rollback and one which bears emulation from elsewhere. In the shorter run, at least, the resources to combat this plague will need to come from outside. The contributions from the United States in the 1990s were the largest in the world, but the figure involved, about $70 million a year, were frankly rather paltry given the scale of the epidemic and the resources of, of the United States. In the first Bush administration, that figure has been raised dramatically, at least in terms of what is promised, to something on the order of $15 billion over uh, the, the coming years. Uh, we will see, of course, as we would with any uh, promise uh, about, about the, the delivery. There's already some fear that some of those resources uh, channeled through faith-based organizations are emphasizing only the A and the B, the abstinence and the fidelity to one partner uh, with um, 
a, a dropping of the, the third leg of the education com, uh, campaign, and that is condom use. Well, as I've tried to do in these lectures on rather uh, depressing topics, frankly, I'll try to, to end on a note of hope, and I'm going to do that by quoting uh, a woman named Asunta Wagura. She's a member of an organization in Kenya known as the Network of Women with AIDS. And this is what she says. So, here I am, an ordinary person with what is rapidly becoming a most ordinary virus. I've stopped feeling sorry for myself, and I've now learned to live, think, and even act positively. I've come out of my hideout, and I found a stage where I can tell the world that I am not a victim, but rather I am a messenger, a messenger of hope. Tell me I'm not a number, a statistic, but an equal partner in this struggle. Thank you.